So the landlords are struggling to make ends meet as the CDC extends eviction ban. So the eviction here, uh, the ban goes until June the 30th, 2021. And so it was set to end a few months earlier and they decided to uh, extend it. And so from what I'm going off on what I've been hearing from tenants and landlords here, and I'm speaking about Los Angeles and unincorporated Los Angeles as well, South LA, because I've been seeing uh, people getting evicted like every week. There's like clothes, furniture, a lot of uh, belongings put out towards the curb. And so somehow these landlords are able to get the evictions underway. And there may be several reasons why they're able to do it. And the reasons being if there's criminal activity or refusal to pay rent, um, there could also be destruction of of the rental units and this is speaking about rental property and there could have been the issue like before the pandemic there were people that might have already had evictions prior to the pandemic even beginning and so d through the duration of the the eviction ban some of those people were able to have uh, a longer stay rather than be evicted because a lot of things were put on hold in the courts. However, landlords have band together and they have a, um, a group where they have actually sued. And so the landlords, they're struggling to make their ends meet as the CDC has extended their ban on evicting tenants. So any landlord, these are the stipulations that they have put forth that any landlord who fails to comply with the CDC policy can be slapped with fines of over $200,000 and they could even face prosecution, uh, criminal prosecution. So it's looked at as being an illegal practice. But however, somehow landlords have found loopholes through lawyers, um, maybe some legal help, uh, legal loopholes to still evict tenants. And so I literally see every week new people that are getting evicted left and right here in South Los Angeles. And so with so many Americans, according to the article by Brittany Hunter, many Americans are out of work and unable to pay rent. The CDC and Prevention instituted a nationwide eviction ban on residential rental properties. So with the moratorium originally set to expire January 31st, newly elected Joe Biden, the president, on the first day of office, signed executive order prolonging this eviction ban until the end of March, at least. So March is now ended, and now we're going into April. And we're already in April, April 1st. Being it so, it says under the eviction moratorium, tenants who fail to pay their rent or mortgage are shielded um, from removal so long as they submit a form or a declaration. There's a declaration form to their landlord proving their financial hardship is a COVID related situation. So there's a declaration form and it's on PDF or you could look on um, I believe it's California.gov and they have um, a section on housing and you can look up uh, 
a template uh, form that can be printed off and you can sign off on it and basically it states that you have this COVID related hardship and that is why you're having trouble paying rent. But you must have submitted those things and you have to keep a line of communication open with your landlord so that they know in good faith that you're not trying to avoid paying rent, but you're trying to express to them why you have been um, limited income or you were impacted somehow with the, the uh, current crisis of COVID. So any landlord who fails to comply, okay, with the CDC's policy can be slapped with fines of $200,000 and face criminal prosecution and even be forced to serve time behind bars. So that's pretty hardcore. So no one wants to see the homeless population rise. And I'll interject in here. The homeless population has been increasing even before the pandemic. And now during this pandemic and a lot of uh, job closures and a lot of, you know, businesses closing down, it has impacted a lot of families and lives. So a lot of people are impacted in many ways where they are victims of what's happening right here, where they could be evicted because they're unable to pay the rent. Um, that is, of course, unless they have some some uh, external help or some type of uh, resources that will reach out or they can reach out to to find some kind of help. And so most people were really dependent on the moratorium so that they could have a place to stay for as long as they could. But now we're reaching a point where many, many people are being ousted from their place of residence. And no one, it says they want no one to see homeless population rise. But what landlords who are also, they have bills to pay themselves and mouths to feed. So that is the question. So the individuals seem to have forgotten that when we look at the casualties of the nationwide financial crisis, it also includes some of these landlords as well. So the Northeast Washington, D.C., Archie Jabati, um, or the Beatty, I don't know if I'm saying that last name, just say Archie, owns a four-unit building where he also resides himself. So according to Washington Post, he's a 35-year-old who bought the building with dreams of building a legacy that he could pass on to maybe his kids in the future, an aspiration that has since been placed on pause by this moratorium. So the eviction crisis has been unique a unique situation for, I'll say, Archie, because his neighbors are also his tenants. And so you want to help people, but it's also a business as well. So you have to keep that in mind is what he's probably reiterating. So that's the way it is. So in February of last year, just one month before a pandemic changed nearly every aspect of our lives, Jabati had to file an eviction suit against one of his tenants after he had failed to pay rent. This was before the pandemic had occurred. So not only was the tenant delinquent in his rent, but he also had been using drugs on the property and had strangers funneling in and out of the units at all hours, becoming a nuisance to other residents. And so this is some of the issues that people have had. So I'm going to stop right here. Some of these people that we see that are being evicted now from the landlord's side of it, some of these people already had evictions prior to the pandemic even occurring. What the moratorium did is it sort of shielded them temporarily so that they didn't have to leave right away, even though they had already had evictions in the works. So there might have been things already going on. So 
Now, I'm going to just be frank about what I've seen here in South Carolina. There's been some people who, the same thing, the same issue that this person is, is referring to, the drug dealing, people going in and out of the buildings, taking advantage of the moratorium. That has happened a great deal. This is not the people who have just lost jobs and they really need a place to stay and they don't know where they're going to get their income. They're just hanging on by a thread and they're trying to pay a little bit here and there, but they can't pay as much as they did when they were working normally before the pandemic. We're not talking about this group of people. We're talking about people who already had evictions, already were problem tenants, and they already were looking to get rid of these people, but the moratorium came because of the crisis. The moratorium was put in place to protect tenants who needed it, and it also protected tenants who were troublesome tenants and tenants that already had evictions before the pandemic occurred. And so these are the ones we're seeing a lot of these people that have to leave. Um, and so that's what makes it a complicated situation because you want to protect people who need it. Unfortunately, it protects some of those who are taking advantage of the ones who really need it, um, that uh, circumstance. And so the court rightly sided with Archie, but the eviction process came to a screeching halt as the COVID had began spreading across the country. So 10 months later, and the tenant in question is still living in that apartment without paying rent while violating the terms of the lease and protected uh, against eviction. And so this is what some of the people of the landlords had been experiencing. So the moratorium is not only a problem to other residents, but is also robbing the building's owner of $1,002 a month. So it's coming out of my pocket. So I'm in a very tight situation. So this landlord or owner had to actually pay for the, the months that this individual refused to pay for simply because they refused to pay rent and they already had a prior eviction way before the pandemic and so you see the precarious situation that some of the landlords are in as well so archie's story is just one of many specific legal pacific legal foundation attorney spoke to a landlord in louisiana who explained that she had trouble paying her mortgage due to a loss of income as a result, she could no longer afford essentials like prescription medications, all because of the eviction moratorium. Okay, so it has caused different issues in different places and different people's lives in different ways. And it's affected people um, probably, I would say, forever. Um and so it's going to take time for a lot of people to regain whatever it is they've lost because of all of this pandemic crisis and this moratorium. So the Louisiana and Washington, D.C. are not the only regions with a strict eviction moratorium. So L.A. is one. California is one. Los Angeles City. So the term landlord might con conjure up images of or conjure up images of slum landlords taking advantage of the tenants and leaving them with the dilapidated unlivable dwellings. Yet in Southern California, which is here where eviction is prohibited for any tenant who is, is able to pay at least 25% of their rent or mortgage, 70% of the rental building owners own fewer than 50 units. And so these small landlords are worried about how they will stay financially afloat with eviction moratorium to be continually expanded. So they can, legally, they can ex decide, depending on how this pandemic goes and the crisis, to continue to every month expand the moratorium. Some were even, there were groups 
that were for rent relief and for rent freeze and for all of these uh, tenants as a sort of a, a collaborate to extend the moratorium until the end of 2021 until I believe I believe they wanted to extend it to all the way to almost like the down the end of the year but it's already gone more than a year that this moratorium has has pretty much been like some referred to as a can being kicked down the street and as you have people who refuse to pay rent those landlords are having to cover the cost of that and then tenants who really need the programs and really need the help are being also abused in ways where they have to deal with the nuisance tenants and then they're suffering because they don't know what they're going to do because jobs are not as readily available and they close because of shutdowns or maybe they have huge uh, layoffs temp on a temporary basis which is elongated because of the pandemic crisis and so as of um, New York, landlords are dealing with the same concerns as well as the state recently passed what uh, New York Times called the most comprehensive anti-eviction law in the nation. So the ordinance puts a pause on eviction proceedings already filed in court. So a lot of these people, too, if we see some of these people that we see all of a sudden getting moved out, they already had an eviction even before the crisis had hit. And so landlords can't keep hanging on with those folks. So they have to leave because they haven't made any provisions. They kept a line of communication as to why they're not paying their rent. So it's assumed that they're just not paying anything because they're just not paying it, the refusal of paying anything at all. So the ordinance puts this thing on pause. Any eviction proceedings are already filed in court and prohibits the landlord from beginning any new proceedings until at least May the 1st. So this is April. So some people already know this. If they know they refuse to pay rent, you're going to start seeing more people leaving these units or ghosting. Some people even refer to it as ghosting their apartments. Now, what I've heard is some of the apartments are trash. They put holes in the wall. They paint on the walls. Uh, urine, feces, markers. They damage the flooring. They tear up the floorboards. They make it more expensive so that not only the landlord had to pay during the time that they were refusing to pay, but they also have to pay a large amount of money to have those apartments Basically, they have to fix all the damages because this person trashed the apartment. So I'm hearing there's a lot of apartments that have been trashed or ghosted, abandoned. And so we're going to see a lot of that from these people who pretty much were just kind of like having a field day rent-free from those individuals, those particular tenants who were troublesome tenants. So the ordinance puts... It on pause, it says. So May 1st, which is now we're in April, is only a month away. So in Oregon, the newly passed House Bill 4401 extends eviction bans also until June the 30th, 2021. So several landlords have since filed lawsuits against Governor Kate Brown Portland in Portland, Oregon, and um, Mo. Molamon County in response to the new law. So many constitutional attorneys have questioned why CDC is making policy decisions in residential real estate market, given that the Constitution does not authorize it to do so. So only Congress has the power to create and pass laws. So that is the case that they have built in court. And so that's why a lot of a lot of landlords have pretty much put together um, their um, 
response in all of these moratoriums and who should be helped and who shouldn't who should not have you know this shielding and um you know they have pretty much now you have some landlords that even take photos of the damages that were done to their apartments uh um their property as it was trashed by um, the troublesome tenants and so that pretty much validates why they had to uh, evict or remove those tenants. So the Public Health Service Act does give the CDC authority to take steps to curb the spread of the virus, but it only authorizes the agency to provide such inspection like fumigation, disinfection, sanitation, pest extermination, destruction of animals, or articles found to be so infected and contaminated with other measures. So the CDC has extended that authority to, and by claiming that allowing landlords to evict delinquent or a destructive tenants will exacerbate the spread of this virus. And so that had really put a thorn in a lot of landlords and didn't sit well with a lot of people because they feel that they took advantage of this moratorium and had a free-for-all. And so you'll find some people ghosted apartments, they trashed apartments, they painted on walls, they scribbled and scrawled on walls, graffiti, they ripped up floorboards, uh, they must maybe uh, have done things to uh, units in rebuttal um, just to spite landlords or owners of property. They destroyed try to destroy apartments. So well-intentioned as the eviction moratorium may be, these policies often cause unintended consequences than solving actual problems. So it's unclear how many people would actually have been evicted in 2020 without these bans, okay? So during 2008 financial crisis, for example, despite fears of mass eviction, homelessness eviction rates stayed relatively the same as before the crash occurred. So the moratorium placed the burden on the housing uh, solely on landlords, of housing solely on the landlords, perpetuating the financial hardship. And the country um, is already facing. So there are more effective and reasonable policies that would protect those truly struggling from the pandemic-related hardships while also making sure landlords aren't losing their income as well. So many people are struggling right now, but not everyone is being asked to bear such a heavy weight on their shoulders. So no one's asking restaurants, grocery stores to give out food for free. So why are the government agencies with, a, uh, with no authority to legislate asking landlords to provide a service without compensation as well? So that's the other case. So this is what's said by PLF attorney Ethan Blevins. So as is the case with many national crises, the government is making a power grab wherever it can feasible just to justify doing so, ignoring the separation of powers guaranteed in the Constitution. So PLF has filed lawsuits on behalf of struggling, and I, I will say this again, multiple lawsuits on behalf of struggling landlords in Ohio and Louisiana, but landlords have, and Los Angeles as well, in California and many, many other places and countries, they continue to suffer the consequences of the CDC's actions. So that is what is going on. So that is the reason why these landlords have had it a lot of them have said, that's it. We're going to do whatever we can to get out the troublesome tenants and the ones that are not we're, um, making any efforts to pay anything and just basically taking advantage of a situation. And um, I believe in you, I, I've seen it for myself as well, where some tenants have been like more than 15000 30000 in the hole. And they just totally refuse to pay any rent whatsoever. And they haven't sent in any declarations when they get a notice on their door. They ignore it and they throw it in the trash. 
there have been incidences of drug use, um, uh, lots of, uh, of apartments that are being used for criminal activity. Um, in some cases, because any crisis and any crisis, you have groups of people who really need help, and then you have people who look at it, oh, this is an opportunity to, to take advantage of this while we're going through this crisis. And so this is the reason why the landlords are saying no more. We want, we want to be heard. And this is our position on this whole issue during this time that we are also struggling. And so this, I'm not saying I'm picking sides. I'm basically reiterating in, in the voice of what these landlords are, are saying or maybe feeling about how they are faring through this pandemic as well. So this is a huge issue. Um, and it seems to have reverberated around uh, the country. And what I've noticed is here in South LA, um, I, I kid you not, I see every week someone that's getting evicted. And I believe that a lot of these people, if it wasn't of no fault of their own, it was the fact that some of it too was out of naivety because they assumed that when the crisis happened that they were hearing rent freeze and that meant don't pay any rent at all. And so I did hear some people, unfortunately, they got so far behind in rent to the point to where they can't pay it back. And so when, when you're in a position where you feel like you can't pay anything back and you, you just stop paying, then this is also too what we we discovered where here in Los Angeles that people are getting evicted because they weren't really clear on what this moratorium, the requirements were and what it all meant by them. Do we pay a little bit here? Do we pay a little bit there? Or do we just not pay anything? Now, there are some situations that are a little more extreme where people really can't afford to pay that much. And so that's where the declaration comes in. And so I, I believe if it isn't the fact that people are just not really knowing how this thing played out because they didn't have anyone that legal help or someone that could explain to them the, 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 the laws or the requirements or how the moratorium is supposed to be set up in their, their city, their state. That is what caused the confusion for some people. And that's why some people, unfortunately, are being evicted because they get to a, a place where they're so far behind that they can't turn back. And so they need the help as well. But it may be too little too late if they didn't follow through with what they should have done by keeping this communication open with their landlords. And so landlords too, I'm hearing the rent relief, they had to also look at the tenants, look at their situation, and depending on who those landlords, everybody has different landlords. Some are more empathetic than others. Like, this one particularly said, owning a rental property is a business, and so they're going to treat it as such. And so that is problematic as well, because when you have uh, landlords that look at the rental prop property as just a business, to these tenants that they say that had came in and they were doing drug dealing and what have you. When they first screened these tenant tenants, what did they see that allowed them to move them in the first place? And I'm just gonna, you know, this is my opinion from what I, I believe that has happened to in South LA is a lot of these landlords when they operate the rental 
properties as businesses, their thing is money. And so if you have drug dealers and they have large sums of money and they come with money, they could have criminal histories and whatnot. A lot of these landlords, they just see the money and they don't really do the thorough screening of the background of these individuals to see that they have credible jobs. And then if they do have jobs, the jobs, when you look at them, they're not really jobs that could pay the rent. So you got a question if, okay, why does this tenant come with $50,000 in hand, but they work at McDonald's or Burger King? How do they have this amount of money? And where do they get this from? And why would you come here to rent out an apartment with that amount of cash? And so if a person is willing to accept that money, you got to look at them too. Because they're not looking at the safety of the other tenants. They're not looking at the background of this person that comes with all this cash to see well, how did you obtain this money? You know, and maybe it isn't as much as fifty thousand. Maybe it's maybe they come with, you know, maybe fifteen, twenty thousand dollars or something like that. And they all of a sudden they're able to produce enough cash that they can put a deposit down on a place. You know, and they make up a story, you know, maybe they make up an elaborate story that, oh, I have me and my sister will rent out an apartment together. We'll split the cost and this is what we have. Maybe in the beginning they look like they're, they have some credibility to them, but then as the months go by, they're not making the drug money anymore and they're not making the income and the, the monthly payments stall. You got to question who are these people, you know, if they're not, you know, if nothing happened to them to cause them to lose their job, then who are they? You know, that is the question. That's all I'm saying. I feel like, you know, when landlords see money, that's all they see. They don't see the people. And so in the end, these landlords, they say that, you know, they want these negative or trouble tenants out but they didn't say that when they saw them coming with that cash and so they weren't concerned about the other tenants safety and whether they were allowing somebody that had a you know checkered past move into a building and become nuisance, nuisance tenants all they saw is this person has $20,000 and we just want it. You know, we'll let them move in. We won't even do a, a thorough background check. Just let them take the money and just go. And so you, there's a double-edged sword on all of this. So this is from the perspective of maybe tenants who they had to deal with these nuisance tenants. And they saw things because some of these landlords don't live in their rental properties they have like a, a manager that lives off site and he comes ever so often or may not even come at all to check on the needs of the, the tenants that are there. They figure we don't have any relatives, we don't live in these properties, so we don't care. All we care about is that we collect money and that's it. And so pretty much this is it really doesn't look good because i feel like we're going to see a lot of more homelessness increase in 2021 than ever before because of this right here and this crisis and you know what i heard is there's a surge that is already here and that now it's the reverse at first people were worried about trying to get tested for covid now you can get a test in many places, rapid speed. Some places you can get a free COVID test. That's not an issue anymore. Then it was about the vaccine. You had people from wealthy communities coming to the poor communities and they were somehow making appointments. People couldn't get appointments. Now more people are getting vaccinated. Now you have more vaccination um, medication and 
still not enough arms getting shots. So this is the other side of it that we're looking at and these variants that are floating around. So what does that say if CDC is warning that if things are like they are and now they're trying to do all this reopening of theme parks, schools, you know, are we going to go fall back into this? So landlords are probably trying to hurry up and get these tenants that have, like, the ones that already were due for eviction long before maybe a year ago. They're trying to get them out. And so it's a mess. It is a mess. And it's not just in one one state, one city. It's, it seems like it's spread it. That's a virus. Thanks for listening.